Welcome to China Perspectives, a podcast on economic and credit developments in China, featuring experts from within and outside of Fitch Ratings. My name is Yin Wang, head of APAC Energy and Utilities at Fitch Ratings. In today's podcast, I'm joined by my colleague Wei Yu, director of the Greater China Energy and Utilities team at Fitch Ratings, to discuss the key credit trends of China's coal mining industry. Wei is based in Shanghai. He has been with Fitch since 2016. Wei, thanks for coming. The Chinese coal industry has gone through some pretty volatile ups and downs in the last seven or eight years. It used to be one of those industries suffering severe overcapacities, and therefore it became a key focus of China's supply side reform. But in the recent two to three years, thermal coal prices, both domestic prices and seaborne prices have rallied quite significantly. So Wei, do you think this positive price momentum is sustainable? Thanks for having me, Yin. Uh, we generally have a conservative view on coal prices over the medium to long term. Coal prices were very high in the previous years, not just driven by demand, but more because of supply disruptions globally. Uh, now we see the market balance has been restored. Going forward, we expect gradually declining demand as a result of global energy transition, which uh, would continually put pressure on coal prices. This is already happening. We see coal consumption from developed economies like Europe and Japan. It has been declining. In China, the massive solar and wind power installations last year uh, will satisfy most of the incremental electricity demand this year. So we expect growth of coal consumption to sharply decelerate, if there's any at all. That being said, uh, mining costs have generally risen uh, because of global inflation, and we also uh, have seen limited greenfield mines. This will probably prevent a very sharp dive in coal prices. Thanks, Wei. Um, but to what extent have Chinese coal companies benefited from the strong prices in the recent years? Has there been a fundamental improvement in their capital structures? I would say the strong coal prices certainly alleviated some financial pressure, but it was uh, maybe short of a fundamental improvement. Uh, we have tracked the financial performance of the 12 largest coal mining companies in China, but not including those with significant exposure to power generation business like China Energy or Huanan Group. The 12 companies managed to reduce their aggregate net debt by 6.6%, during 2021 to the first nine months in 23, which was great, uh, unprecedented, because China's coal mining industry as a whole had never been able to reduce total debt before 2021. But 6.6% reduction in net debt is not enough to turn around the trend. We fear that uh, with coal price moderating, the industry will probably fall back to negative free cash flow and mounting debt. This is very interesting. I want to highlight that nearly all of the thermal coal miners in Australia and Indonesia rated by Fitch Ratings have significantly reduced their debt load, and some even achieved net cash positions due to the strong coal prices. So this contrasts with what you just described about the situation with the Chinese state-owned coal miners. The Australian and Indonesian coal mining companies simply have reduced debt to a much greater extent. Why is there such a big difference? Uh, right, right. I think the truth is, compared with Australian and Indonesian peers, Chinese coal miners were bearing much heavier financial burdens before this coal price peak. They also have some structural challenges that haven't been resolved either. So it would be much harder for them to get out of it. We have done some research. During 2021 to 2022, we estimate that the 12 large uh, coal companies we just mentioned generated extra revenue of about 730 billion RMB because of high coal prices. We try to track where the money went. First of all, these companies would have generated big negative free cash flow in a normal year. So about 20% of, of the extra revenue was actually to cover that. Then about one third of the extra revenue was spent on higher costs and expenses. 9% of it was to pay higher dividends and interests. Another 9% was made into various investments. 
So that leaves these coal miners only 19% of that 730 billion RMB to reduce net debt. Another risk that investors could overlook is structural subordination. Many of these large groups put most profitable assets into listed subsidiaries. So their consolidated financial statements look much stronger than the actual cash that the holding companies can access. Where HOCOs do not have enough cash flow to cover expenses and investments, they can only resort to borrowing more debt. Or to say use financing cash inflow to fund operating and investing cash outflow. So the proportion of debt at HOCO level kept rising. For the 12 largest coal miners, the ratio of HOCO debt over total debt rapidly rose from 46% in 2014 to 65% in 2022. We noticed that during the coal price peak, the ratio did not drop either. So suggesting uh, subordination risks remained and could further increase in the future. Okay, now let's talk about the impact of energy transition on the coal mining industry. Public capital market financing and bank financing for thermal coal projects has become tightly restricted in many Western markets, including Australia. Even in Indonesia, we are seeing that thermal coal project level debt financing is becoming much tighter than a few years ago. But corporate level funding is less impacted if the company has a credible energy transition plan. What's your observation on Chinese coal companies' debt financing access and funding risk in the future? We haven't seen any restrictions on coal mining companies financing in China yet for the obvious reason that coal accounts for over half of China's primary energy consumption. Actually, the strong coal prices have largely restored and improved coal companies' success to the domestic bond market. Bond yields of almost all the large coal companies are now uh, lower than they were during 2019 to 2020. Some companies that were not able to issue long-term bonds are because of the impact from Yongchen Coal's default, but they have resumed issuance now. This is encouraging to hear, but do you think Chinese coal companies are prepared for energy transition? And given where they are today, how do you view energy transition-related risk for them? Thanks, Ian. I, I think this question is very good and it very well summarizes our discussion today. Energy transition will be a gradual process in China. China may be very close to its peak of coal consumption, but after the peak is reached, we expect the decline to be slow, at least before 2030. In the short term, we expect limited risks to Chinese coal mining companies given better funding access. However, in the long term, there's no visible solution to the dilemma between Chinese coal companies' rising debt and declining demand for coal. Business diversification of Chinese coal mining companies have not been very successful either, and mostly still confined to coal-related industries. We haven't seen much growth in non-coal profit from those Chinese coal miners in recent years. I think when coal prices fall into a cyclical trough, some companies could find themselves in financial uh, troubles. Okay, so based on what you just said, if I can summarize it this way, the large debt stock of the Chinese coal mining industry may not be a near-term problem, but it's something that needs to be tackled um, in the medium to longer term, given increasing energy transition risk. Would that be a fair summary? Yes, I would have very much agree with this uh, conclusion. Thank you very much, Wei, for your great insight. That's all we'll cover today. You have been listening to Fitch Ratings China Perspectives podcast. To learn more about our ratings and research on China, visit us at fitchratings.com. Please subscribe to iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Take care until next time.